Alright everyone, welcome back. Um, in this video, we are going to talk about how you can shoot an enemy with a bullet and have them disappear from your game when they get hit. So at this point, um, what you should have is you should have a player that's able to move around and then shoot whenever you press a key. Um, so if you do not have this, make sure to either watch the player move video or the, the bullet video as well. Um, Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and get started. So what I want to do is I want to make an enemy, and I want to make it where if that enemy gets hit by a bullet, then you know, they would disappear from the game. So how do we do that? Well, to test this and to even get this to work, we need to make an enemy class. So let's go ahead and do that. Make a new tab. Um, the name of this class, of course, needs to be enemy to match the name of my class. And then I can go and start making this class enemy and you you probably have done this a lot by now, so let's go ahead and just bust through it. So we got variables. What variables does an enemy have? We're just going to have an X and Y position. I'm going to give it a width and height as well. I'll probably make mine like a rectangle of some kind. You can add a color if you want. Um, hmm, and I think for now that's all I'm going to do. We're going to add some other things here in a minute, but for now this is all I'm going to have. Um, I'm going to have a constructor, so enemy. The, of course, what the constructor does, it describes to the program how do you make a new object or a new individual of this class. The goal and job of this constructor is it needs to initialize every variable here. And so, cool. What we also always have to think about, though, is do we want to tweak what these are every time we make a new enemy. And I think, yeah, probably do. We do want the X and Y to be different for every individual enemy. We might also want the width and height to be different, right? And so what we need to do is we need to make sure to have parameters then, because if you have parameters here, that allows you to change them for every individual enemy. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, so I'm going to call my parameter for my X something like starting X. And I'll just have that same convention for all my other ones. So starting Y, starting with starting height. And then inside, I'm just going to initialize these. What is X initialized to? Well, it's initialized to be starting X. Same thing with Y, starting Y. Width is starting width. And height is starting height. Cool. Oh, I misspelled something. There we go. And really quick, I just want to go ahead and make a render function. So void render. And what should this render function do? Well, for me, it's going to make a rectangle using my variables x, y, width, and height. Cool. So, of course, this isn't everything, but let's go ahead and just test this to see if we can draw a guy on the screen. Um, I'm going to come over here, make an enemy. I'm going to call it E1. And I'm going to initialize it as well. E1 equals new enemy. And of course it freaks out, and that's because I don't have parameters for my enemy, so I need to give it an x, y width and height. Uh, I'm going to put it for the x, maybe something like 300, maybe 200 for the y, for the width and height. I'm going to make it maybe 100 wide, and then 200 tall. Uh, also, I want to make sure I'm using rec mode center, just because that's what we've been using uh, for most of the semester. So in my render, I'm going to do rec mode center. Cool, and this, um, that's E1. I'm going to just come down to my draw, say E1.render, and let's see if we got it drawn. Hey, there it is. Nice and big. There's a big enemy. Cool. Um, now, first of all, we're going to want to have several enemies probably in, in my game or in your game as you start making it. So before we do anything else, I don't like this. I don't like having to say, like, cool, E1.render, because we're going to have to make other functions we'll have to call. And I don't want to have to copy and paste that over and over again. So let's do what we did with the bullet. Let's make an array list for enemies. So I'm going to make an array list. It's going to hold things of type enemy. I'm going to call this enemy list. Enemy list. Uh, I'm still going to initialize enemy 1. Um, I'm going to do this because I want to put enemy 1 in a very specific spot. But I am going to initialize my enemy list. I'm going to do that by saying enemy list equals new array list holding things of type enemy. 
And then down here, instead of saying e1.render, I'm going to have a for loop that says for bullet call, sorry, not for bullet, excuse me, for enemy called an enemy in enemy list, just following the same format as the for loop that goes through my enemy bull or my bullet <laughs> array list, excuse me. Um, now that we have this, what do I want to do to every enemy? Well, I want to render it. So I say a or an enemy dot render. Press play. Oh, yeah, so nothing popped up. That's very bad, right? That's because I never put E1 in my list. So in here, in my setup, I'm going to say enemy list dot add E1. Now for press play. There's E1. There, there they are. That's cool. While we're here, let's go ahead and make a second enemy. Enemy E2. You know, et tu brute, right? So we got E2 here. Copy and paste that. I'm going to put this one a different X. I'm going to put it at X equals uh, 600. And then I'll give it a different Y. I'll give it a Y of 300. I'll give it, I'll make it smaller. 50 with 100 height. And then I'm going to say here, enemy list.add E2. Press play. No pointer exception. Oh, I got an error here. What did I do? Oh, I said E1 equals twice. It should be E1 equals something and then also E2 equals something. Then press play. Now it's better. Now I got my two enemies. And of course, if you want it more, you could have as many as you want. Um, you know, you have a timer or whatever you need. So you got all kinds of stuff. So you'll notice, though, if I press play and I shoot, it doesn't impact my enemies in no way. And that's, of course, because there's no collision detection happening between my enemies and my bullets. So we need collision detection. Well, how do we do that? Well, the first thing we need to do, of course, is we need to have hitboxes for our bullet and for our enemy. So let's come on in here. I guess we'll do bullet first. And we need to come on up, and we need to add hitbox variables. So let's go ahead and do this. This is going to be identical to how you did things uh, earlier in the semester with the collision detection Hello World assignment. So it should be the same logic here, so it should look very familiar. So I'm going to come on in here and say something like int left for the left bound, int right for the right bound, int top for the top bound, int bottom for the bottom bound. Um, now I made these variables in my class. Of course, they need to be initialized in the constructor. So for my left, um, and really quick, just to remind you about what this looks like, if I move on over here, if I have a you know, bullet with the position being in the center, and the width of this guy would be D, the height of this guy is also D. If I want to define the left bound, We know left, if you're moving left or right, that's like you changing in the X. So left depends on the X. But if you're at the X and you're going left, you're subtracting something from it. And how much are you subtracting? Well, you're subtracting the diameter divided by 2. Now if you're doing this, the right bound is going to be the same type of thing. It's still x, because x changes if you move left or right. But if you're here and you go to the right bound, you're not subtracting. You're actually adding. So it's plus d divided by 2. And if that makes sense to you, then the top and bottom should also make sense. Because it's the exact same logic, but instead of x, it is y. Because if you move up or down, y is what changes. So top is y minus, because you go up, you subtract. But as you go down on the screen, you add. Cool. So th that's that's our equations here. So let's go ahead and go to here in our bullet, and let's go ahead and put those here. So left equals uh, x minus t divided by 2. And then right equals x plus. Top equals 
y minus d divided by 2, and then bottom equals y plus d divided by 2. Cool, so we have this here. Now, something I want to show you. If we go back to our setup and draw, and if I put in my for loop for my bullets, if I say print line left, let's say, Oh, sorry, a bullet dot left. That way you know to access left. Um, I'm also, I have this print line from earlier. I'm going to delete that print line where we had the size so we can test this. If I print out print line, you know, a bullet dot left. Actually, not left. Let's do, let's do dot top. The top bound of the bullet, as the bullet moves up, should change over time, of course, right? But you'll notice if I press play and shoot my bullet, the top bound is never changing. Always this number. Even though the bullet's moving, the top bound is not moving with it. And that's a problem. So why is that happening? Well, that's happening because this hitbox was defined in the constructor, which is important. You have to do that. But that means they were only defined at that one frame where you first made the bullet. As the bullet moved, these were not updated. So what you have to do is make sure these hitbox variables are updated every time the bullet moves. Well, the easiest way to do that would be to copy these equations, go down to the move, and then put this in here as well. Put these same equations. That makes it where if the bullet moves, it updates the hitbox. So if you press play, if I press the space bar, now you'll see the top actually moves. So that, notice it actually gets smaller because it goes up. So that is good. Okay, so that's hitbox stuff for the bullet. Now we got to do the exact same thing for the enemy. Uh, I'll kind of speed run that because it turns out the logic is identical. So I'm going to even call it the same names. Left, right, top, and bottom. It's okay with having the same names because they're in different classes, so it does not get confused. And even the equations are the same. So left is equal to x. But it's not minus diameter because there is no diameter, but it is going to be minus width divided by 2. Right is equal to x plus width divided by 2. Top equals y minus height divided by 2. Bottom equals y plus height divided by 2. And of course, if the enemy is moving, you want to make sure these are updated every time. Um, I am not moving my enemies, so I don't have to do that. But if you do have moving enemies, make sure to update these every frame. Cool. So now what we need to do is we need to think about how do we, whoop, how do we actually do collision detection? Because even though I have a hitbox, there's no collision detection, of course, right? And so, cool. Um, the way we do that is we have to make a function either inside the bullet class or inside the enemy class. Because what we have to do is we want something from one of these classes to interact with the other. In other words, we want something from the bullet class to interact with the enemy class. That means to do that, we have to make this function either inside of the bullet or inside of the enemy. Um, it doesn't matter which one. There's no magic answer here. Um, it's either or. I'm just going to put mine inside the bullet class, I think, because in my head, collision's happening because of the bullet, so I'm going to put that collision function in the bullet class. But if it makes sense to you to put it in the enemy class, cool. You go for it. The logic would be pretty much identical. So now that I'm here inside the bullet class, I'm going to make a function called collide. I'm going to uh, I'm going to call this not collide. I'm going to call it shoot enemy. Something like that. Now, this function is in the bullet class, so it already has access to all of the bullet variables. But it does not have access to the enemy variables. So we need to fix that. So, to make it have access to the enemy variables, we have to give it an enemy parameter. So we have to make sure I'm going to have a little parameter here. I'm going to call it of type enemy. I'm going to name it something like an enemy. So th by having this parameter, this function has access to all of the enemy parameters, including the hitbox. But because it's in the bullet class, it also has access to the bullet hitbox. 
So now what we do is we just do our usual if statement, uh, our if statements for collision detection. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, we're going to say if the top of, if I just say top because I'm in the bullet class, it knows I mean the top of the bullet. If top is less than or equal to the enemy's bottom, you do that by saying an enemy dot bottom. And if the bottom of the bullet is greater than or equal to the enemy's top. And if the left side of the bullet is less than or equal to the right side of the enemy. And if the right side of the bullet is greater than or equal to the left side of the enemy. If all that is true, for now, let's put a print line. Print line hit, or something like that. Cool. So let's go ahead and test this, right? So I need to call my shoot enemy function. And this is actually something kind of interesting. You might not have seen this before. Because um, you'll notice, if I press play, you know, I have not called my function yet, so it's not doing anything. Um, since it's in the bullet class, you usually would call it inside this bullet for loop. So I could come in here and I could say, cool, a bullet dot shoot enemy. But of course, the issue is, is that shoot enemy expects the parameter to be like an enemy. But yeah, sure, sure that should be no problem though, right? Um, the problem is, is all my enemies are stuck inside my enemy list. Hmm. So how do I get access to my enemy list? Well, usually what that would mean is I just say, cool, I just call that thing in my for loop for my enemy. So usually I'd put that in here. So I could just take this, put it in here, and then I could put an enemy in there, an enemy. But then you'll see now it's also mad because now it doesn't know where to get a bullet. Hmm, so how do we deal with this, right? So how do we deal with us giving the function access to every bullet in the list, but also for every enemy in the list? Well, it's actually pretty easy. What I'm going to do, I'm going to kind of undo that a little bit. You see how I have a for loop that goes through all the bullets? Well, inside that for loop, I can have another for loop that goes through all my enemies. And I'm just going to basically put the exact same for loop I have up here. This for loop will go through all my enemies. So now what I can do is I can say, cool, a bullet dot shoot enemy. And inside that I could say an enemy. And it knows where to get that because it's getting it from this for loop. But it's going through enemy list. And it knows what a bullet is because it's getting that from this for loop. So this kind of combination here will compare every enemy in the list to every bullet in the list. Which means I don't care how many bullets you have, I don't care how many enemies you have, this will check for collision. So that's a lot of talk. Let's give this a little test. If I shoot, boom. Ah, notice it said hit. I'm going to press play again. I'm going to go to the other, other enemy over here. It also said hit. And if I had, it doesn't matter what enemy I had or how many, this would work. So that's cool. Um, however, the enemies are still on the screen, right? They have not been destroyed. They have not been killed. How do we handle that? Well, it turns out, if you remember from the last video, there's a method we used that allowed us to remove bullets whenever they got past the edge of the screen. The way we did that is we made a Boolean called should remove. And we had an if statement down here. We had a function that made that true at some point. Then what we did is in our setup and draw tab, we had a for loop that went backwards. And it said, hey, if should remove is true, then remove that thing. Well, we can do that exact same logic with our enemies now to make those enemies be removed. Now, here's the question we have to answer first. When should an enemy be removed? Well, an enemy should be removed whenever they get hit by a bullet. So if you go in here, here's a cool thing. We already have a function that detects, detects that. We have this. It detects collision. Right now it prints out the word hit. Instead of printing out hit, 
let's actually make an enemy have a boolean that becomes true here. So I'm going to go back into the enemy class. I'm going to add my boolean. You can call this. You can call it should um, be removed. Um, I think it's a good name. Should be removed or should remove. Um, in the past, I've called it something like is dead for an enemy, because I mean, like the enemy's dead should be gone. Um, I think it, it sounds a bit more explicit if we call it should remove. So I think I'm going to stick with that. So should remove. Since I made this new boolean in my enemy class, I can go here. And inside my constructor, I can make it false because I don't want to remove it right away. So we initialize it to false. Once you have that back in the bullet class, instead of printing out hit, I'm going to say cool. If collision happens, make an enemy dot should remove true. So what does this do? This what this does. We'll add a little comment as well. If the bullet collides with the enemy then flag the enemy to be removed so that's what this does so that makes it where the boolean becomes true so that's cool that's great however just because we have that does not mean it's removed right what we have to do is we have to have a reverse, a, a for loop just like this, just like what we did for the bullets, that goes in reverse order, and it will check that should be remove boolean. If it's true, it will remove that, that enemy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this for loop, making sure to, to get the right amount of brackets. I'm going to just gonna put that here. I'm going to adjust my comment, for loop removes unwanted enemies not unwanted, I'm going to call this killed enemies. And I'm just going to adjust my for loop. So instead of bullet list, there's going to be enemy list. And so instead of enemy a bullet, it's going to be, or instead of bullet a bullet, it's going to be enemy an enemy. And instead of bullet list, it is enemy list. Instead of a bullet, it's an enemy an enemy. Uh, oh, and this should be enemy list. Enemy list. There we go. Cool. So now if I press play, if I now shoot, notice the the enemy went away. I can shoot this guy too. The enemy goes away. Now you'll notice the bullets also stay alive as well. So if I shoot, it kills the enemy, but the bullet keeps going. We can also fix that pretty easily. Um, what we do is like, here, in our collision function, don't just make should remove for the enemy be true. You can also make it true for the bullet. So we can just say should remove equals true. And since I'm inside the bullet class, if I just say should remove, it knows I mean it for the bullet. So now if I do that, if I shoot, both the bullet and the enemy go away. And there we go. So that's how you actually remove a enemy whenever they get hit by a bullet. Um, if you want to do melee attacks, it's the same thing, but instead of spawning a bullet, you just check to see if the enemy's at a, a hitbox, which is going to be next to your player. But yeah, that's basically it. Hopefully that was helpful.